So we have other internal dashboards that we use, uh, more custom JavaScript built, but um, a lot of it and what I'm working on is using the Tableau side. We also have a really cool Tableau public uh, site. If you guys haven't seen it, I would check some of this out. Um, Skylar Johnson is another employee there. He's, he's pretty popular with the Tableau public community. He does uh, a lot of the work and things that you see on this site. So I've been thinking uh, from my previous job as a consultant and now at Spotify, I'm looking at dashboards and helping people design dashboards all day. Um, you know, for like about the last three years, and so I've had a bunch of common themes when I am critiquing or giving advice to people about uh, how to make their dashboards more user friendly. Um, so I decided to put it together in a presentation for you guys. These are some of the most common things that I am constantly telling people, and that I think um, when you think about user friendliness in, in Tableau. Um, there is a lot of reasons why people at companies aren't adopting dashboards. So if you ask people um, that you've created dashboards for, are you using it? Um, sometimes you get a mixed response. So uh, like, yeah, you know, sometimes I'll look at it, but I don't really know exactly how to use it. Um, so see, this, these are some of the most common reasons I've seen as far as why people don't end up adopting their dashboards. They can be tough to find, the average person that isn't super fluent with Tableau server might not understand how to navigate that architecture. And so if they don't have a specific link, they're not able to navigate to it. So creating embedded solutions or a repository of all of your dashboards or a dashboard of dashboards I've seen um, can, help, can help that uh, people find your, your work more uh, easily. A lot of times people will come in and the data isn't up to date and so then they lose trust in that dashboard. Uh, they can be broken, you know, something with your data pipeline um, has broke and now people don't trust them and so even if you get it fixed, that's not going to be the spot they go to find it. Um, and a lot of times you're just missing the mark on how to make these useful for people. So you want to design dashboards that are actionable and that actually are relevant to the business in some way. And so a lot of times I hear that uh, people don't know how to answer the questions that they have with their dashboards and they just want to get the data in Excel and play around with it themselves. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, lastly, I think for stickiness of dashboards and being dropped in, like we said, not everyone here is super familiar with Tableau and they might only look at a dashboard once a month or a couple times a year and so they're not uh, always equipped to be able to understand all of the interactivity and the inner workings of Tableau dashboards. So there's ways that we can, as designers, make them a lot more user friendly for people. So during this presentation, this is something I whipped up um, in using all of Tableau's baked-in defaults. Um, it's a decent dashboard, something that you see quite a lot, uh, but I'm gonna show how to take something like this into something a little bit more user-friendly, a little bit more pleasing um, to use and interact with uh, like this. So we're gonna walk through some of the elements going on here, and hopefully you guys can take some of these takeaways uh, back with you to your jobs. So one of the biggest things that, um, when I started thinking about designing for user friendliness, uh, the word context kept coming up. Um, so I'm gonna talk about context from a data visualization standpoint, as well as more of a user experience and design standpoint. So when thinking about adding context to your visualizations, uh, one of the first things I like to use a lot of spark lines. We saw Daniel talk about how he uses spark lines in some of his in his Tableau dashboard. So essentially a spark line is when you're showing a line, usually you have it zoomed in so you're not showing zero and uh, all the axes are turned off. Sometimes even you're not really sure what the date range is. It's meant for you as a user to understand the trends if it's going up or down or staying steady. Uh, 
at the same time, sometimes we lose context when we are taking off those axes and hiding the labels and numbers. So I'm going to show you a few ways that um, I've seen out there that I really like to add context to Spark Minds. So this is a dashboard by Luke Stanky. Um, he created this a while ago. It was tracking ticket prices for football games uh, as you get closer and closer to the event. And so typically what happens to the third party uh, resellers is people start to panic once they haven't sold their tickets and they drop the prices as you get closer to the game. Um, and so this is a visualization showing that. And you can see all of these spark lines are going down. Uh, you might just think that they're all decreasing at the same rate. Uh, but what he has done on his is just a simple addition of labeling the high point and the low point. You have a little bit more context into how big that drop actually is. So with like the Pittsburgh at Miami game, that's dropping over $100, whereas in the Oakland game, it's only dropping about $30. So that's important as a user to understand uh, both that it's going down, but that context of how much it's going down. So if you guys have iPhones and look at the stock app, um, I can't speak for what it looks like on other phones, but this is the Apple stock app, and I really like this design. So they have a quick spark line that shows your daily movement. Um, if it's going up, if it's going down, it's nicely colored. What they also have is your percent change. So you can see right there, if it's going up, 0.7%, going down 3%, 2%. Just knowing the percent change, though, isn't always enough. So in the app, if you actually click that button, it will change to the raw change. And so you can see that raw difference of 2%. How much does that actually matter? So there's Tableau. I think this was a couple days ago, so sorry, but your stock went down. Um, <laughs> you can see the difference between uh, the actual percentage and then the raw <laughs> change. But then the final piece that you need to have full context into this is the volume. So if Apple goes down 1%, it's going to drop quite a bit more than a stock that's $10 a share. And so having these three pieces together provides you as a user the full context into what's actually happening. So. Think about that if you're showing spark lines to maybe include some of this information about how much things are moving and the volume of what you're showing. A lot of met, uh, <laughs> metrics that we use on our dashboards are ratios. And so on this dashboard that I've created, we can see I made this made up um, pretending that our company cares about sales per customers. And so in 2018, our sales per customer declined 28% from 2017. And so the question that I want to know, if I'm the CEO of the company, is why is it decreasing? And so the choices are A, our sales decreased, but our customers remain steady. B, our sales increase, but our customers are actually increasing faster, so our sales per customer is going down. Or C, our sales stayed steady, Customers are increasing. So, what do you guys think it is? A, B, or C? I heard C. Any A's out there? A. Okay. I think the point here is we need more context. We don't really know what happened, right? And so, whenever I'm dealing with a ratio metric, I like to show actually what's happening within the numerator and denominator of that. So, a simple addition of those other metrics of sales and customers will allow us to understand why it's going up or down. So here you can see our sales per customer is going down because our total customers went up 43%, where total sales only went up 2%. So it's not just as simple to say that our sales per customer is going down, that means our sales aren't improving, because here you can see they actually are improving, uh, but customers went up more. So in the lens of Tableau and how we can add context for our users being dropped in, you want as little of friction for people interacting with, um, knowing where to click, understanding what you're seeing. When you think about a user-friendly design on your phone or on a website, the best 
what I would call user experiences are ones that you don't even really realize are there. You just inherently are dropped in and know what to do. And so there are some tricks that I use in my Tableau dashboards that can help us accomplish that. Um, so I have this section in this dashboard that's breaking out uh, sales by region, segment, and category. And this is all fully interactable. Um, you can click into a bar to filter by the West region or by consumer segment or by your technology category. Um, like I said, as a user that isn't familiar with Tableau, maybe they've been using Excel spreadsheets their whole life to analyze this data, they might not understand that you can click bars to filter in Tableau. And so just a simple instruction and a little touch icon um, can really help orient people with what's possible. Another thing that I commonly see is when you're clicking around in your Tableau dashboard, sometimes you can get so deep in the rabbit hole that you don't know what exactly you've clicked. And so particularly if you click in one section and you maybe have a long scrolling dashboard, you scroll down and then you lose the context of what you actually have filtered up above. And so this is a little trick that I like to use in those cases where you actually build out a navigation pane of your filters. So when you click into a bar, it will show you what you have filtered. The other part of this, I'm going to jump into Tableau here in a second and show this trick. Uh, the default when you click something is that it highlights that color and then everything else dulls out. I'm going to show you guys how to actually change the color so that when you click, you can make it be any color. And this is another indicator. When I'm looking at this, I can see the blue bars are the ones that is what we have filtered. So it's just reinforcing that to the user. That's what's going on. So here is how that first filter navigation details is created. Uh, it's a calculated field comparing strings. So you're saying if the minimum region equals the max region, the way that that would happen is if you have it filtered to one region, then we're going to show uh, ATTR is how you just put that string in an aggregate form, essentially. Uh, it's going to show that one region if there is only one filter. Otherwise, what we want to do is we want to count the number of regions and say we have that number of regions. So that's why I had two bars selected for segments, and now it says two segments. All right, let me jump into Tableau and we can show you guys how to change the color of those bars. All right, so I'm gonna do it on this one for region. Um, what I wanna do first is we're gonna utilize dual axis for this. So I'm going to copy the metric that I had there and now I have another axis created. If I make it into the dual axis, always make sure they're synchronized for this. Um, when you click things in Tableau, even if they're fully transparent, it will highlight as the full transparency. So that's what we're gonna take advantage of. The bars that we're placing in front are gonna be fully transparent, but when we click them, they're gonna become whatever color we want. So I'm just gonna quickly move that opacity down to zero, uh, select my color, and then I don't need both of the labels, so I'm gonna hide that label on the first one. So now you can see when I'm clicking, it becomes that color. If I wanted it to be orange instead of blue, then now I can make my bars orange. Uh, so this is a pretty simple trick, it's just a quick little dual axis, but um, you guys can align this to your company's color palette. It makes it more fun, and it helps the user understand what they're clicking um, as you go through your dashboard. So the other part that I want to show is using a parameter to both filter and highlight at the same time. Usually, uh, within our filters, you're going to subtract away from those bars. Let's say you're filtering by region. Um, then 
you only are left with that one region bar. But if we just want to highlight that we have that bar filtered and filter the rest of the dashboard, we can use a parameter to do that. So back in Tableau, I'm going to do this on the category. This right here is actually a parameter. So I created this from the field of category, and then I added an all value. And then within this chart, on color, I have something called category color. So that calculated field just says, I want to color my bar when my category equals my parameter selection. So now when I select something on my parameter, it's going to use that true false to color it or not color it. Uh, everywhere else in the dashboard though, we want it to filter. And so I've created a category filter. I could simply use that same color thing and have it be a true false, but then it would only work for individual selections. I wanted to have it be useful for all as well, so then I just say if category parameter equals all, then one equals one. So if we have all selected, this is always going to be true. Otherwise, if we're selecting a single category, it's only going to select that one category. You just set that filter to true, and it will work. OK, so the final piece, um, I care a lot about creating professional dashboards. I think Tableau is great for uh, doing this for your company and creating reports that everyone's going to be looking at. Um, obviously, Tableau is also good for just doing ad hoc reports where maybe you don't need as much profession, you know, uh, professional touch to it, uh, doing data exploration. But when you're creating something that's going to be used by people over and over again, you really want to take a little bit of extra time at the end to polish them. Um, so one of the ways that I do this is by creating dashboard templates. So it's going to create a unified design across um, your reporting so that within your team or your company, your dashboards look and feel the same. You're going to create that sense of familiarity so people know, uh, here's how I interact with my dashboards, here's where my filters are, here's what happens when I do this, and then you can have that common functionality across all of your dashboards. I think you'll find that your users are really going to start to buy in to using them uh, more than if every dashboard by all of your different authors look and feel a little bit different. So one of the ways that you can do this, um, creating a header that's common. So you could have your company logo, uh, little icons within your filters, make sure that your filters, uh, the ordering of them makes sense. So I have geographical and customer and product grouped together here so that as I'm looking across my filters, it's easier for me to find where to go. One of the things that I like to do when you're doing multiple value dropdowns, um, the default is just as you start selecting different things, the sheets that that's affecting are going to be re-rendering every click. If you go into customize and show the apply button, it'll actually wait for you to make your selections and then render so that you're not re-rendering every time that you have to select things. Particularly if you're going through and selecting five to 10 uh, categories, this can be really annoying, and that's a quick way to fix it. Um, in most cases, you're gonna want to have only relevant values, so that's not the default. But if you're selecting region and you select west, you don't want states in the east to be available for you to select anymore. And so that's a quick and easy win to help make that more useful and intuitive. Um, if you're having single choices, uh, some dashboards are only built for a singular choice within the filter, but then you forget to uncheck the all, which is the default. And when you have all selected, it's going to blow up and destroy your dashboard. So all of these simple little things, but um, when you add them up together, it can really make a difference. Uh, I like to use footers in my dashboard. So you can put a whole lot in your footer. It's only going to take up about 30 pixels at the bottom. But 
some of the things that I like to put in those. Um, an icon where you use a custom shape, and then in the tooltip, you can have as much text as you want describing the dashboard, where the data is coming from, how to interact with it, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a sheet that actually has a URL action associated with it. So when you click this email, contact info at dashboards.com, it's going to use a mail to URL link. You guys can download these slides afterwards to see the exact text within that. But you can have your emails be data driven based on what dashboard they're coming from um, and customize the subject and the body of them. Um, if you are typing in any text box and you put HTTP colon slash slash before your website, it's going to turn into a hyperlink automatically. So you can use that in your footer if you want to navigate to a website. And then I like to have the context of when my data is up to date. So you can just create a sheet, use a max date uh, on your label, and then have a little disclaimer at the bottom of how up to date your dashboard is. So a few more thoughts, um, like we've already talked about tonight, utilizing white space. Uh, Tableau has the great padding feature, uh, which has been around for a couple of versions. I am in love with that feature, and I use it on all my dashboards. Instead of putting floating blanks or uh, trying to fit things together, this makes it a lot easier to provide that uh, visual relief to your dashboards. Um, most of the time, when I am encouraging people to create dashboards, sticking to simple visualizations is a good trick. Uh, there's a reason they're the classics, they're the easiest to understand, they're what people are most familiar with. There are certain cases where more advanced charts can be helpful, but um, if you're just starting out, try sticking to simple visualizations. Um, and using color smartly, so don't have the same color mean two different things within your dashboard. You really want to think about your dashboard in grayscale first, and then figure out where color can be used to spotlight the insights that you're trying to attract your audience to. So usually when I design, either on a whiteboard or in Tableau itself, I have a very grayscale dashboard, and then I add color in later. These are a couple of my Tableau pet peeves. People that have worked with me have uh, probably gotten annoyed with me always telling them this. So, a lot of times we create sheets like summary tiles, KPI tiles, that are never meant to be clicked. They don't have tooltips associated with them. Yet when you click them, they become this little blue box. If you float a blank over them, you're not going to be able to click them. And it's going to be a much nicer and feel a little bit more like a, a web app that you'd expect uh, and not something that just has all these boxes that are randomly clicked. Um, a lot of times we design and we only think about what our dashboard is going to look like when all of the data is perfectly in there. So when sheets are filtered, if you have the entire view selected and you're reducing the number of bars, for example, it's going to blow up and fill the whole screen and look goofy. Um, the way around that, you can use fit width or fit height to specify your row height of a bar, specify your column height of a bar if it's vertical. Um, and I would always, like, I tell my users, click around, use all the filters, make sure your sheets can handle the longest string so they don't become weird pound signs. Um, all of these little things uh, stacked up together can make a big difference. So one last trick. Uh, within summary tiles, if you have data that is a wide range, so it can go from hundreds to thousands to millions, as you're filtering around. A lot of times users don't want to see all of the numbers. It's not important to see your millions out to um, you know, the hundreds. And so I want to show it as 1.1 million, but then when I filter it down below million, it might become 0.4 million. But what I really want is it to say 400.1k. So this is a way that just using logic to get the metric when it's between those different values, um, creating a calculated field for under a thousand 
between a thousand and under a million and over a million. And then if you stack those together in your label or tax field, it's only going to equal one of those at a time, but then you can customize the display units of each of them. Eventually, this might be a built-in feature rather than a hack, um, but for now, this is a way to hack that. And so, as you can see, these are a lot of simple tricks. Like, I haven't uh, reinvented the wheel on anything here, but as you start to stack them up, you can turn from what I showed you in the beginning out of the box to something that looks a little bit more like this, and it's going to be much more user-friendly. Um, this is downloadable. I posted it to Tablet Public today, and so you guys can go to my profile, download this, use it as inspiration, um, and actually see how some of these tricks are implemented. So the very last thing uh, that I want to talk about, um, a fun project that I want to work on. So Netflix, I figured this out a few months ago. You can actually download your viewing history. Um, how many of us are Netflix bingers here? All right. So I'm a huge binger. As you can see, I watch The Office a lot. Um, I have this idea to create a dashboard that will visualize your binges across different shows and to see the statistics of your binges. Um, you can see the days where I've watched like 15 episodes in one day um, and how long it's taken me to run through these. Um, I want to create a dashboard that uses all of our data and can, we can compare ourselves to each other, see who the top vendors are for different shows. Um, so I have an Alteryx workflow that does a lot of this data prep. Um, I've created a Google form, and I'll figure out some other ways to share this form out. But it's a way for you guys to, if you want to be included in a fun dashboard like this, um, let me know what name you want on the dashboard if you want to remain anonymous. <laughs> put your actual name there. You don't want people knowing you've watched the office 20 times in one day. Um, so this will be, I'm going to tweak this out, and um, if you want to just come up to me after this um, and let me know your email, I can email the form to you if you want to be one of the first people included in this new dashboard that I'm working on. Um, I think it'll be pretty fun. So thank you guys. <laughs> Any questions? Go ahead. I'm curious about your um, kind of uh, um, self-help server management, um, where you're chipping in helping server apps. How does that actually work? Because in our world, you know, we've got to keep the screen to a certain scale. Yeah. And they want this function they want to upgrade now. Some people say, no, don't upgrade. Or, uh, how, how does that work? Um, we're actually hiring uh, someone to take over that. <laughs> so, uh, potentially that's an answer to how well that works. Uh, but it, it's been OK for the time being. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're hiring someone to do that. <laughs> Any other questions? On the 19th of November, we'll have uh, Cole and Netflix who will be doing a hands-on workshop. Uh, so book your diaries. Uh, the the event of Splash if I, if invite should come out next week. Uh, you'll need your laptop, but it'll be good to, to have you there. So we'll be standing in the kitchen using uh, kind of a workshop hackathon type, uh, type thing on the 19th of November. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is first, uh, thank you to all the speakers tonight. We really appreciate you guys taking the time. Jacob, I know you're here on holiday, so I appreciate you spending the evening with us. Um, I would like to thank you for taking part and coming in tonight. And I know it's like taking a bit of your, your evening during the week, so we really appreciate you coming. Uh, finally, uh, thank you to, to Tom for uh, lending us a space and information lab in the data school for greeting us so well today. And I think you have a couple of words to say as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, 
you, you guys are really, really impressive tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm unimpressed by the 50 or 60 or so people that were registered for tonight that didn't turn up. I'm amazed and impressed by you guys who ate all their pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, congratulations for doing that. Um, I just want to say uh, we, this is our new building. We've just built this building specifically to uh, run events like this. This particular space has been built to run lots of events like this. Uh, and we, we are going to be starting to run events two or three times a week, generic data events, Alteryx events, Tableau events. Some of you will see links on the chairs in front of you, uh, till.bi slash talkdata. That will take you into a meetup group where you'll be able to find out about what's coming up in this space and in other spaces. So if you're, if you're interested in coming to more events like this, then, then join that community. Uh, send it to others, send it to your colleagues at work, because uh, we really want to run as many events as we can. So uh, I echo David's sentence. Thank you very much, Jacob and Daniel, wherever he's gone. And AD, thank you very much for presenting. And thank you all for turning up. And thank you to the community of, of organizers who run the, to the London Tableau group. Thank you for everything you do. A thankless task, I think, a lot of the time. Um, and if anybody would like to stay for another beer, then please feel free. As long as the light's on in the fridge, we are good. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, sorry, thank you.